Good morning, everyone. Malachi chapter 3, if you're not there. Malachi chapter 3. Um, we may or may not finish this book this morning, or we may just get through the first, first portion of chapter 3. I don't know. Um, there's a... There's just a lot here. But anyway, we've looked at two churches, and actually we could have looked at three, uh, but we've been focused upon two churches, the churches of Laodicea. Uh, the church of Laodicea is a church that speaks of the last days, but it also can speak to us individually and personally. You know, uh, and Jesus was saying to the church of Laodicea, you're neither hot nor cold. And because you're neither hot nor cold, I just soon spew you out of my mouth. And <clears throat> that's because they really were not giving value uh, to the riches they had in Christ. They were placing more value upon the riches they can get from the world. And so they believed they were rich because they were materially rich. They were financially rich. Um, then there was the Church of Sardis, which was really... Uh, not in tune with the Holy Spirit. They were just kind of relaxed. They were just kind of out there. They were just focused upon the church programs. You know, they had a lot of things going on, but the Spirit was not involved. And Jesus was saying to this church of um, Sardis, wake up, wake up. And if you don't wake up, then your name will be erased from the book of life. Um, so much for once saved, always saved. When that didn't matter. Jesus is making this proclamation throughout the, the seven churches, but, and uh, we kind of see it in the book of uh, 1 Timothy we see, we're, we're looking at tonight, that, you know, you're not going to lose your salvation, but you can most certainly walk away from it. You can most certainly become hardened in your heart where you're not in tune with the Holy Spirit. Uh, so you can't lose it, but you can most certainly make a choice to walk away from it. And that's basically what God is saying to the uh, uh, the people in Malachi's day, um, you know, they had actually divorced themselves from the Lord. But he's, he's calling for repentance to each and every one of these churches in the book of Revelation, just as he's calling for repentance to the people in Malachi's day. And uh, where I'd like to land this morning, put this in the forefront of your mind as we go through Malachi, what is God asking of us? What is he truly desiring from us? And what is the way of repentance? What is he calling for the way of repentance? Uh, and to the church, um, no, it wasn't a church, it was to the nation of Israel, he's saying, start giving tithe again. And we'll get into that. It's not some, something that's legalistic. It was for Israel, God had written in the law to give tithes. He was demanding it from them, so they weren't giving it to them, so they were robbing him. But what we know is tr what's truly happening here is what God is asking for and what he's asking for in our day is our hearts. He wants our hearts. He does, it's not our, our money that he wants. Now, giving is important for each and every one of us. Uh, but if we're giving for the right reason, it, with the right motive, Israel would start giving tithe. They would be giving tithe in the time that Jesus came to them. But what were they pursuing in giving tithe? Righteousness. But you see, our righteousness is not what we do. It's in what Jesus has done. And that's why it's important for us to see the cross. Because the cross is what's going to uh, establish our motive into giving. Now, maybe you're a Christian. You've seen the cross. But you don't have a will. You don't have a desire to give. You don't have a will. You don't have a desire to serve. So what, what's truly happening there is you just don't see the cross as fully as you should. Because if you see the cross, you'll have a will. You have a desire to give. On the other hand, now this sounds very much like a, a paradox. You know, it, it is a paradox, should I say. In other words, it sounds contradictive, but it's true. There's two statements being here. It's said here. One that sounds contradictive to the other. If you don't see the cross, if you desire to see the cross, if you want to experience more Jesus more fully, not to be righteous because your righteousness has found Him, but if you want to see the cross, if you want to experience Him more fully, then the pathway, the path, the key is giving. 
And that's one of the things we're going to get into as we get into Malachi chapter 3 this morning. But there's a call for repentance here. God is calling for Israel's repentance. What is the call for our repentance? If we see that in the, in the church of Ephesus. So we're going to look at the church of Ephesus before we get into the reading of God's Word in Malachi. Ephesus is the church of the first age. It's the first church that existed in the first 100 years of, of the church. It was, the, it was in existence, those first four 100 years. They had a heart for God. They had a love for God, but they had departed from that love. And God is speaking to them. He says to the, uh, picking up in the Revelation chapter 2, verse 1, to the angel of the church in, in Ephesus, write. Now, this could be you. And it would, speaks of a certain age, but each one of these churches speaks to us specifically, personally, individually, and also corporately as Calvary Chapel. So listen to what he says to the church. Pick up verse 2. He says, I know your deeds your toil and your perseverance, and that you cannot tolerate evil men. And you put to the test those who call themselves apostles, and they are not. And you, you've, and you found them to be false. And you have perseverance and have endured for my name's sake and have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else I'm coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. If he removes the lampstand out of its place, that's what he's saying. He says, I will, and another way to paraphrase this, I will erase your name from the book of life. You will not have a place in heaven. That's ultimately what he's saying. I could get deeper into that and, and, uh, through the text here. But going on, it says, Yet this I do have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I have also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now, turning back over to Malachi chapter 3. Anybody super hot? Anybody cold? You're, could I turn the heat down just a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. <clears throat> <laughs> well, maybe I shouldn't turn it down. We're at least hot, right? <laughs> Get that lukewarm place. <laughs> Malachi chapter 3 um, we're going to read the chapter uh, let's start with verse 1 it says behold I'm going to send my messenger now again um, let me give some explanation of what's happening here um, they had drifted far from the Lord they had divorced themselves from the Lord God has been calling for repentance and uh, right now, he's telling them how he is going to bring them to repentance. This is actually a prophecy of Jesus' first coming. Later on, he'll get into Jesus' second coming. But right now, this is Jesus' first coming. He says, I'm going to change your hearts. How would he change their hearts? By way of the cross. They would truly understand the heart of God, the true nature of God. It would, it would motivate them. That's, what, that's his desire, to motivate them in their service to him, their love for him. So He says, Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come out of his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller slope. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of, Liz, as, as the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. So that they may re, uh, present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. 
Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, and against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, to the widow and the orphan, and those who turn aside the alien and do not fear me says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? And he answers, will a man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me. The whole nation of you. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open up for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I will rebuke the devourer for you so that we, it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will, your ripe, or, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Your words have been arrogant against me, says the Lord, yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said it is vain to serve God, and what profit is that? Is it that we have kept his charge, and that we have walked in the morning before the Lord of hosts? So now we will call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of wickedness built up, or up but they also test God and escape. And again... It's, it's, we're under a law here. God has written in the law to give tithe and offering. And so Israel, because they were not doing that, were robbing God. Now we're not under a law. It's not a requirement for us to give tithe and offering. But it's important for each and every one of us to give and tithe and offering. We don't do it so that we can be righteous. We do it because we are righteous and because we've seen the love of God. And if again, if you, if you don't have this desire in giving, then that's the reason you should give. We love because He first loved us. Lord, we have believed and now we know you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. See, giving is in our best interest. God does not need our money. Trust me, He doesn't need our money. We need to give, though. It's important for us. But again, the key to giving is seeing the cross. Now, you, again, you don't give. Well, if I'm going to be righteous, I've got to give. I've got to give tithe and offering if I'm going to be righteous. You can be righteous without giving, but you're missing out. You're missing out. You are missing out. You're missing out on the blessing. And that's ultimately what God is saying to the nation of Israel. Again, um, this, is the, uh, this is a perfect illustration. You guys, some of you have heard it before, but I'll say it again so you can get the idea here. Understand, let me back up here just a moment. Again. God spoke to Israel through Malachi. And immediately after this, Israel started giving tithe. They gave tithe. They were, but they were essentially bean counters. God says this, if we're going to be righteous, then we've got to give tithe. And they essentially became bean tithers. They were tithing mint and deal. You know, they counted every, everything they brought in. They started counting out. One, two, three, four, four, my, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, my, for me, 
One for God. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine for me. One for God. They were very specific. They were very detailed. But their hearts were far from him because when God, Jesus showed up, when he walked through the gates of Jerusalem, they didn't know him. They couldn't see him. They didn't understand him because their hearts were far from him. They did what the law said, but they still didn't know God. They missed him when he showed up because they didn't see him. They didn't see his heart. And that's why Jesus came. And that's what John wrote. No, no one has seen God at any time. With the exception of the only begotten who's in the Father or in the bosom of the Father, he came to explain him. He came to explain the true heart, the true nature of God the Father. The Hebrew writer says he's an exact representation of the Father's heart. Exact representation of the Father's heart. What do we see in Jesus? He's, we, we see one, one who was filled with the Holy Spirit to such an extent that joy was flowing out of him. People loved hanging out with him. What people? The drunkard, the prostitute, the, the thief. They loved being with Jesus. They, they hung to his every word. Israel didn't see this kind of nature in God. They seen him as this angry judge, this cosmic cop, this ultimate killjoy. He, he came to bring us joy so that we might have life and life abundantly. They just didn't see it. The way to see it is the way of the cross. That's why Jesus, or I'm sorry, God, his place, this verse right here in the in uh, chapter 3 of Malachi, this first portion of, of chapter 3, it's important for, the, for us to understand what he's saying. He's saying, I'm, you, your hearts are far from me, and I'm coming to change your heart. And it comes by way of your giving. But we got to understand the purpose of our giving. Jesus would say, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. See, it's our pathway to drawing near to him, to see him more clearly. He says, behold, verse 3, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. He's talking about John the Baptist who would come on the scene, and he would, what would he be doing? He would be preaching the law. The whole purpose of John the Baptist preaching the law, pointing to the Pharisees, pointing to the king, pointing to these other people was saying, your sinners, you fall short of the glory of God, and the, this is what the law says, and this is what's revealed in your life. You need a Savior. He came to prepare that way so that the people would see, we're lost, we're, we're, we're doomed, we need a Savior. So he's preaching the law. He's preparing the way. He's explodes, exposing the hearts of the people. That's why it's so critical for us to do an honest evaluation of ourselves and our motives for the things that we're doing. we got to get down to the motive. And oftentimes it's about our image. It's about our position. We want to appear righteous. And so we do certain things. We give tithe because we want to appear righteous. What's the Christian thing to do? It's not about that. It's about our hearts. And Jesus came to reveal our hearts to us our true heart, and say, I'm the solution. You search the scriptures because you think in them. You have eternal life, but it is these that point to me. They're about me. I'm the way of righteousness. Righteousness is found in me. I'm your pathway. And suddenly, <coughs> and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple in the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, the Lord of hosts. They delighted in the law of the Lord, but they didn't understand the law of the Lord. In the whom you delight, the true nature, the one that you're delighting in, he's coming, and the messenger is coming to prepare the way for him. But who can endure the day of his coming? You think you're all that? 
You think you're righteous because you keep a law, because you're under this legalistic system. You think that you're doing all the right things. You think you've got to squeeze yourself into the mold. When he stands before you, you're going to see your true nature. You're going to see who you truly are, and you won't be able to stand. But that's what it's about. We see what Jesus has done. We realize, I fall short of the glory of God. I don't compare to this. We're always making these lateral comparisons, right? Well, I'm not as bad as Adolf Hitler. I'm not as bad as this guy. I'm doing pretty good. We're all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. What is the neighbor, Adolf Hitler, the nature that he had, the evil that was in him, is in each and every one of us. We're just as capable of doing what the worst criminal has done. If we allow our minds to go in that direction, of course. But we're just as capable. There's not an evil in another person that is not in you. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire. He, 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 he reveals all the bad stuff. And he burns it away through his grace and forgiveness. You want the evil that is within you to be burned away? Well, confess your sins, knowing that he is faithful and righteous to forgive your sin. Confess that sin. Come in agreement. Yes, this is evil, and it needs to be eliminated from my life. But you've got you to be honest. You've got to be sincere. You've got to be brutally honest with yourself. You know, a lot of times we're reading Scripture. Well, you know, we push something back because we don't, wanna, we don't that, want that confronting us. We've got to allow it to confront us. And like fool or so, verse 3, he will sit <clears throat> as a smelter and a purifier of silver. You know, that's what, you know how silver and gold was purified. You know, they'd heat it up in this pot. And, and as they heat it up, all the impurities would come to the top. They'd wipe away that impurity, right? And they just con continue this process until the refiner could look into the pot. You know what he would see when it was finally to its purest point? He would see himself. So the more you see Jesus, the more you're going to love Jesus. The more you love Jesus, the more you're going to want to see him. Gold and silver, verse 3, so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. Repent. Go back to where you were. And that's what Jesus does. He brings us back to that true place of worship. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. And I will be a swift witness as we draw near to Jesus. He becomes more of a witness of our true nature, the Esau that is in us, the Antichrist that is in us, the flesh that is in, in us. As we draw near to him, he becomes a swift judgment. You know, I can see this. I need this out of my life. He gets to the heart of the matter. We're all sorcerers. We're all adulterers in the flesh. We all swear falsely. And against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, the widow and the orphan, and those who turn aside the alien. Now, we're not talking about we shut down the borders and don't let the Mexicans in. That's not what we're talking about. We, we turn aside the alien, the people that come in to our church body, and we reject them because of how they look, how they act, how they walk, how they talk. Oh, you can't be a Christian until you do this, that, or the other. We do that, you know, just like the, the uh, Jesus revolution. We were just talking about that. And Chuck Smith, he, he says in the movie, he, he rejected the hippies because they stopped. He didn't understand them. He didn't get them. So he, he had shut the doors of his church so these people couldn't come in. It was a very legalistic mentality. They shut the doors to the alien. We're, our doors are to be open to the alien. The alien of the kingdom. Not necessarily the alien of the United States. We've got to keep this in the proper context. Jesus loves the entire world. For God so loved the world, every individual that is in the world, he so loved them that he was willing to die 
for them. He died for the world, not just for me, not just for you, not just a squeaky clean Christian, Christian, not just the people who fit into the mold, who wears the right clothes, who speaks the right language, do the right things like giving time, just like serving. It's all a matter of the heart. And they had lost heart. God's uh, a true heart for God. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. <clears throat> from the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes. He hasn't changed because he loves us. His true heart's desire is, is to save us. <clears throat> and have not kept him. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? He's basically going to say, just like Jesus said to the church of Ephesus, do the things you were doing before. Get back to the basics. During the days of Moses, Moses led the children of Israel through the Red Sea. He led them through the desert. And along the way, God was providing water from a rock, manna from heaven. And then God gave Moses the law. Moses gave the people the law. So they were following this law because this is what God was demanding of them. And so Moses, he takes them through the desert, giving them the law, God providing water from a rock and manna from heaven and protecting them with a, 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 a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. They get all the way to the Jordan River, all the way to the edge of the Jordan River. God says, cross over. But they wouldn't. They couldn't. They looked over the Jordan. They seen these giants. Well, we can't do that. God says, I've given you the land. That land belongs to you. Go in. And they wouldn't do it. They didn't trust him. See, that was what the law does. The law will bring you to the edge of the Jordan. The Jordan is a river of death. It speaks of death. They couldn't cross over the river of death to get into the promised land. The law brought them to the edge. But there was fear. There was doubt. All this stuff in their, in their hearts. There was a lack of trust. There was a lack of faithfulness in their hearts. So they couldn't cross the Jordan. We can't do this. But that's what the law does. Again, the law will bring you right to the edge, but it won't bring you across. Joshua, Yahshua. Joshua means Yahshua. Yahshua is another name for Jesus. Jesus would take them across that river of death. He would take them across by way of the Spirit of the Lord. It was Joshua and Caleb when the, when the when Moses brought them to the edge of the Jordan, it was Joshua and Caleb along with eight others who went into the promised land. These eight come back and give a bad report. You know, the, the, these are, there's giants in this land. We're, we're like grasshoppers to these guys. But Joshua and Caleb, when they came back, they said, let's go in. You know, because our God, and next to these guys, these guys are like grasshoppers compared to our God. We can go in. God has given us the land. Let's go take it. It belongs to us. It was that spirit. They believed God. They trusted God. There's, they, they had the Spirit of God in them. And so for 40 years, God would spend 40 years weeding out all this fear, all this doubt. And then led by Joshua, Yahshua, Jesus. They would cross that river of death and enter into that promised land. Because they believed God. They trusted God. And God is saying, get back to this place. Where you fear me, where you love me, where you're, you know, you're, you're, you're being obedient to me. Get back to that. So he's calling for repentance. Let's go back. Let's go back to where you were. Will a man rob God? So they've asked, how have we... He, 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 well, let's read verse 7 again. For... From the days of your fathers, you have returned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you. 
says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Go back to what you were doing. So he answers their questions. How shall we return? And he says, will a man rob God? Yet you say, how have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You haven't been giving me the tithes and offerings. Ultimately, what this is saying as we take the, the entire Word of God in context here, it says, you're not, you've been robbing me. You, you haven't given me your heart. You haven't put your faith in me. You haven't put your trust in me. So how do we get back to where we were before? What shall we redo? How shall we return? Give me your heart. Will a red man rob you? have been robbing me of your heart. That heart that Joshua had, and that generation that crossed the Jordan, that same heart where my spirit was upon your nation. Go, come back to what, you know, trusting in me, believing me, relying upon me. I want your heart. But how have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? You stop giving to me. You were cursed. Why did they stop giving to God? Because they wanted what the world had, right? And so, well, if, if I stop giving this tithe, I can get that new chariot, right? I can get those new sandals. I can get that new tent. So they started taking, but Jesus said, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. You give me your heart, and you'll have the stuff. But what do we do? We pursue the stuff. That's what Israel did. That's why Israel didn't recognize Jesus, because he promised them, if you give tithes and offerings, he said, I'm going to open up the heavens, and I'm going to pour blessing out upon you, and I'm going to curse the devourer. So what was their attitude? What was their mentality? Shoot, if we give to God 10%, he's going to return a hundredfold. What were they focused upon? The hundredfold, you see. They got focused on the outcome. They got focused on the outcome. And so what do they give to God? Not because they loved him, not because they were giving him his heart, their heart. They were wanted what he promised, the blessing. What's the problem? If you pursue the outcome, you're not pursuing God. If you're not pursuing God, you can't have the blessing. We were talking earlier, right before the prayer meeting. You know, pastor's heart is to reach people, right? Fill the church pews. That's the heart. That can be very noble. But what happens sometimes? We get focused on the number of people that are sitting on the pews. And so now we start pursuing to fill the pews. And so oftentimes we'll compromise. We'll compromise the scripture so that we can fill the pews. Because we're afraid if, we're gonna, if we say something wrong, people will leave. We don't want people to leave. Why? Because we're focused upon the number. If you're focused on the number... You'll never feel, well, you can fill the pew, but it'll be for all the wrong reasons. You're, you're not really, you see, if I'm focused on the number, then I'm not focused upon the God. And I, if I'm not focused on God, then I can't fill the pew. I got to be focused upon Him and not focus on the outcome. What I got to do is focus on Him. I got to deal, I got to pursue a relationship with Him. I got to be honest and sincere with myself. And here's the deal. He may not fill the pews, but the people will grow. The people that remain will grow. See, our ways are not God's ways. Our understanding is not God's understanding. You see, we got to get back to the place where me as an individual is dealing with my relationship with God. I can't be focused on Charlie's relationship with God. Peter, why are you concerned about John? You follow me. You feed my sheep. It's about my heart. It's about your, in, us as individuals, each and every individual's heart. And then it will impact the body. So basically, because you have not pursued me, you have been cursed. Remember Esau? He rejected a relationship with God, but he still expected the blessing. 
But he couldn't have the blessing because he rejected the relationship. That's in each and every one of us. Until we're willing to, to accept a relationship with God, a true, honest, sincere relationship with God, we shouldn't expect a, a blessing. A, a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You can't expect the blessing if you're not pursuing him. Verse 10, bring the whole tithe. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so there may be food in my house and test me now on this. This is the only place in Scripture where God challenges you to test Him. Only place in Scripture. You remember when Jesus was on the pinnacle of the temple and Satan says, jump down from here and see if the, you know, the angels will not lift you up? And he, what was his response? You shall not test the Lord your God. You should not put him to the test. But God here says, test me on this. Put me to the test. <clears throat> now again, many of us are in a place where we can't, we don't feel, and that's okay, don't feel that I can give a full 10%. Okay, let's start there. Maybe you can afford to give 5%. That's okay, as long as you're pursuing him. As long as your focus is upon blessing Him and increasing that amount because you increase the amount that you draw near to Him. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And God says, okay, start putting me to the test at this. Maybe you're only giving 5%. Maybe you're only giving 2%. But make a commitment. There has to be a standard when you start. I'm going to start with this standard and I'm going to build upon this. Now, oftentimes we start with a standard. Well, you know, times have gotten tight. I'm going to break away. You cannot break away from the standard because you, at that point, you're robbing God. You're taking your faith, your trust out of Him and putting it in your money. So build a standard. Say, this from now on, this is what I'm going to do. And that's what God is saying. Test me on this. Put me to test. Let's build on this relationship. Let's start with 5% versus 10%. You know, Tammy and I have not always given 10%. Our goal, I'm talking going back 24 years ago when we first got saved, we were not given 10%. But we, we pursued a relationship with Him. And as we pursued this relationship with Him, our hearts grew for Him. As our hearts grew for Him, as we began to see the cross and what He's done for us and what He's promised to us, our giving increased. So you shouldn't be feeling condemned. What in God there is therefore no condemnation for those that's in Christ Jesus. But understand, you're missing out if you're not giving 10%. I realize I'm looking around the room. Most of you do. I, I, well, I, I can suppose that. I don't know that. But why do you give? Are you trying to pursue righteousness when righteousness already belongs to you? Anyway, I'm get, I got on the rabbit trail there. I don't feel like I hit that first half hard enough, but let's compress on. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open, open the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. What does that blessing look like to you? You hear that? What does that blessing look like for, to you? I mean, really? Is that what it looks like to you? I'm asking this rhetorically. For you, what does that look like? Power, position, all the worldly possessions? Is that what it looks like to you? Well, God's really blessed me because I got this new job and I'm making lots of money now. Is that what it looks like to you? Sometimes it is, but what, what are you pursuing? What is a true blessing of God? The blessing is found in the relationship. And the love and the joy and the peace and the patience and the kindness and the goodness you feel, you experience. See, if you're experiencing depression and despair, then that's just the opposite of what God wills for you, wants for you. 
worry, anxiety? Because that's where Israel was. When they come to the edge of the Jordan, we can't go in there. They were in fear. They weren't believing. That's what God's wanting you to test him on. Get, bring in the whole tithe. And you'll, and you'll experience those blessings. But you got to give him your heart. It starts with your heart. What are you pursuing? What do you really want? We think we want stuff. We think we need stuff, but what we really need is him. And God says, start giving me a piece of your heart. Break off a piece of what you have financially, materially. Give it to me. Test me on this and see if that emptiness, that despair, that worry, that concern is not rebuked. He, he said, I will remove... Oh, he goes on to say... Might just take that portion there, Judy, of the silence and cut it out. <laughs> then I will rebuke the devourer for you. I will, did I finish the verse? If I will not open the heaven, windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Then I... Okay. You'll be fulfilled... You'll be satisfied. You'll experience peace and joy and happiness and content when you truly proceed to me. Now listen to what he goes on to say. So he's talking about a spiritual thing. But then he goes on to talk about a physical, material thing. He says, then I will rebuke the devourer for you. The one who's trying to rob you of peace and joy. He says, I will rebuke him for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground. You're working and you're laboring to pr provide an income, but you know, there's a drought. The, your, your crops are destroyed. This physical thing, he says, I will rebuke that. And I will rebuke that devourer who's been robbing you. Nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. So as, as you give me your heart, as I pour blessings into your life, as I satisfy your heart's true desire, he says as that begins to happen, then all of your labor will become fruitful. And so now you're experiencing this peace and joy. Jesus was... You know, so filled with joy that people flock to him like children to an ice cream truck. Or to children, you know, you know uh, to a playground. You know, they, they, people were just drawn to him. He says, the nations will be drawn to you. The nations will begin to want what you have. They'll see you as this delightful land. Now, as you're out in the world, as you're in your workplaces, in, in your neighborhood, with your coworkers, what do they see in you? Someone who's depressed, someone who's in despair, someone who's angry, someone who's bitter. What do people see in you? Then if, 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 if that's what they're seeing, then you must start questioning your relationship with the Lord. Why is there not peace? Why is there not joy in my life? And it all begins. If you want to draw near to God, He'll draw to near, near to you. What is the way of drawing near to God? And it's Starts with breaking off of this world's hold upon you, which is found in money. Jesus talked more about money than he did prayer. Do you realize that? He talked more about money than he did about faith. Why? It's because our money has a hold on us. When we hang on to money, we're not hanging on to Jesus. You cannot love both God and money. You see, what we're doing, ultimately, money is our God. We're putting our faith in our income, in our resources. If I'm going to be happy, if I'm going to be content, it's going to come by way of the money that I'm bringing into my home. Jesus, you give me your heart and you won't have to worry about your money. I know this is hard to hear because there have been so many people who've corrupted this idea of tithes and offerings through television evangelists and what have you. It's not about money. Truly, it's not about money. It's about where you're putting your heart. Amen? Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will also be. We'll stop there for today. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I pray, pray that people hear it. They understand it. 
and they submit to it in obedience so they can truly experience all the riches they have in you. Lord, that's ultimately what we're pursuing. We're pursuing your blessing, and we know that blessing is found in putting our faith in what Jesus has done on the cross, that he's taken our worry, our sin. We don't have to focus on the law. We don't have to be focused upon, you know, dealing with our sin because you dealt with it. And so, therefore, we can pursue after you and experience all the riches that we have in Christ Jesus. Lord, we thank you for word, and I just pray that it's, that it's been heard this morning. Amen.